Well, good morning and welcome to our Tannisborn online service. We're glad you're joining us. My name is Mike. I'm the pastor and we are currently in a three-week series called Not Afraid. In fact, last week we talked about just that, that as a person of faith, we are not afraid. And if you happen to miss that talk from last week, we posted that on our brand new Tannisborn Facebook page. And so make sure you check that out. Uh, in fact, there is a, a link there, of course, on the screen. And also, if you look at the notes uh, tab, which is something you can click on over where the chat is, then you can see the notes. And at the bottom, there is a link for our Facebook page there. But check that out and uh, make sure you get a chance to be brought up to speed on the first week of our series. Now, two weeks ago, if you were joining us, if you tuned in, then uh, you heard me talk about how that we are formed for God's family that we were created for community, that we're better together. And in fact, if you go back to the beginning in the Bible, in the book of Genesis, the very beginning, where you hear the account of how God created the earth, and the sixth day he created man, and it says that, that God saw that it was good, but there was a problem. Man was alone, and he, God decided, decided that man needed a companion. And so he actually created Eve to be man's companion. And so we, we see that very back in the very beginning that God is a relational God, and he created us to be relational beings. And so we are formed for God's family. Now, with the, the governor's latest orders, the Oregon governor's latest orders that just went into effect last Monday, our social distancing has been put us to, a, to, a, to the test, to the extreme. We're all supposed to be stay home and stay healthy and not uh, intermingle or, or get close to people. And that, that makes this idea of that God formed us for family, for, for relationship, that we're connected. That makes that really difficult, that we're relational people, but we can't really relate in a physical format like we're used to. And in fact, as I'm recording today's message, we are in a completely empty room except for my wife. In fact, I thought I'd show you. Um, I'll, I'll pull up my phone here so you can see what I see. This is my view. I'll, I'll uh, show you here. This, this down here in the front row here, this is Kathy. Uh, we thought she might be a nice little uh, uh, you know, person for my audience. And <laughs> she's kind of creepy. It's a little creepy. This is, I'll zoom in here so you can see. Kathy's a little creepy. And then in the back, you'll see my wife back there. That's my wife. All right, she's representing back there. But anyways, this is just a completely empty space. It's kind of not something that we're used to. But um, that's, uh, that's what we're having to, to, to deal with in this current season of life. And so um, last week, uh, or it seems fitting that in this current season that we talk about this idea of the, our purposes, that we were created for connection, for community, that maybe today that we would talk about what that looks like to live out that purpose in our life, especially as it relates to the context of not being able to get together. Now, last week, I think something really cool happened during our online services. In fact, if you tuned in, you were one of over 450 people that tuned into our services last week, which is pretty cool. There's a, some representation of the fact that we're not alone. In fact, you might have gotten on the chat and had a chance to connect with some of the people that you haven't seen you know, physically for a few weeks, and that was really cool. But after the services ended, I started hearing back from different people who are part of our campus and heard something that was really cool to me, and that is that people tuned in from the state of Washington, the state of California, from Arizona, from Kansas, from Missouri, from Indiana, and New Jersey. I thought that was pretty cool. That was incredible. And all those people are, are connected to, to Westside in some way or shape or form, and that's really cool. In fact, if you are hailing from another state today, get on the chat and represent your state. Get on there really quickly and tell us what state you're tuning in from. We'd love to hear from each other. We can get on there and kind of connect on that level. But maybe I didn't or say the state that you were tuning in from last week. Make sure you represent on that. Oh, and did I miss a state? I might have missed one state. If you're tuning in from the great state of Oregon, we are glad that you're joining in. Why don't you represent by clicking that heart button, go out of control there, represent for all you Oregonians out there who are listening. In fact, I believe the majority of you are probably from the Oregon area. And so uh, that's just exciting to me. That's just one of the evidences that we are not alone. And before we go on and talk more on this topic, I, I just feel like it's necessary that uh, we talk about some good news. You know, we hear all the bad, the negative, and the despair throughout the week. And I thought, I just want to pause as we're in this series each week and share some good news, things that are cool that are happening. Um, you, you, you may know that we are a part of a family of, of churches. In fact, uh, Westside, for the last six and a half years, has been what we call multi-site, where it's been one church in three locations. We're one of those locations. There's an Aloha location. There's a Tigard location. And we feel uh, very led by God over the last nine months 
that it's time for those, each one of those locations to be, become an individual church. So each of our campuses will become individual churches. Our Tiger campus is moving towards being Bedrock Community Church. Our Aloha campus is going to ma- maintain the name Westside. And of course, we will we'll become our own church as well with a, a different name. But uh, one of our, our sister campus, the Aloha campus, I got a word last week that there are seven people that I know that uh, had, had tested positive for the coronavirus. And in fact, it got serious enough that three of those seven people were hospitalized. One of them was, was almost going to have to be put on a ventilator because it got pretty serious. And one of them, who was a, a Westside Aloha Campus staff member, was actually in the ICU for a couple days. So it was very serious for those people. But here's the good news. Here we are a week later, and all seven of them, as far as I know, are doing well on recovering. And so that, to me, is some good news. Uh, some other good news is that that I've noticed in my neighborhood now being working at home now in this season, my office overlooks the, the, uh, the front of our house and I can see the sidewalk and I can see when people are walking by. And you know, throughout the day, I see people coming by you know, every once in a while. But during this last couple of weeks, man, the amount of people who are walking by, getting out, getting, getting in the community, exercising, the amount of families, four, six, eight people that are all family members getting together, walking down the street together, I think it's cool the amount of connection that I'm seeing happen. People are kind of slowing down, maybe stopping and smelling the roses a little bit more. Maybe, maybe it takes something like this to force us to do that. But I think that's a, a good news in the midst of the coronavirus epidemic is that uh, people are slowing down and connecting with other people. And then I think another maybe unintended consequence of all of the staying at home, the quarantining, the lockdowns that are happening around the world is that there's been a dramatic uh, improvement in the air quality. The pollution level has gone way down. And so maybe that's not the way, you know, industrial ha- ha- in the industrial world has to continue. But for now, it's cool to me that that's happened. I even heard uh, accounts that the canals in, in Venice in Italy have cleared up enough that you can actually see the fish swimming down below. And that, that's pretty cool. So I think, though, uh, as I was looking for good news this week, the, the one story that takes the cake for me in all of this is a story about a lady in Bend, Oregon, and her name is Rebecca Mara, Mara. And in fact, I've got a picture of her that you see on the screen there. But I want to read to you her account. You may have already heard this story in the news, but I think it's worth sharing. It goes like this. One elderly couple from Oregon had, re- had recently driven to a Safeway in Bend, Oregon, but they were too scared to get out of their car. After 45 minutes, the wife cracked her window and shouted at the, a young woman who happened to be the professional runner we just saw on the, on the screen there, Rebecca Mara. Rebecca says this. This is her account. She says, I went to the grocery store that, this afternoon. As I was walking in, I heard a woman yell to me from her car. I walked over and found an elderly woman and her husband. She cracked her window open a bit more and explained to me in tears that they are afraid to go in the store. The couple who was in their 80s had heard that the coronavirus was disproportionately affecting older people. Maris said they told, told her that they don't have family nearby that could help them, and though they had been waiting for 45 minutes to find the right person to ask to help them, and they said through the crack in the window, they, they, she said that through the crack in the window, they handed her a $100 bill and a grocery list and asked if she'd be willing to buy them some groceries. She goes on to say, I bought the groceries and I placed them in their trunk and gave her back the change. I know it's a time of hysteria and nerves, she says, but offer to help anyone you can. Not everyone has, to, has people to turn to. After her story went viral, Rebecca Mara spoke to CBS affiliate KBNZ. She says, it was the first time I thought about how much this is really affecting my community. She said of the elderly couple who had asked her to, to help them get groceries, and Mara's Twitter thread resonated when she says that she was overwhelmed by the positive response to her tweet yesterday. Mara wrote this on Thursday, one day after posting the initial story. She says over 11 million people have seen her story and counting, and she says thank you to everyone who is sharing it. Frankly, she says, most people I know would have done the same thing I did. I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. But to me, that's, that's really cool to see people stepping into action and, and, and in the community and showing love to other people. I think that's a really cool thing. So as we talk today about this idea of not being alone, I was thinking of, of one of my favorite movie series, the Harry Potter series. Maybe you've read the books, maybe you've seen the movies. There's eight installments, there's uh, seven, seven uh, books, but they turned the last book into two movies. So eight movies, and the fifth one is The Order of the Phoenix. It's probably my favorite one, and, and in that movie, uh, the fifth one, they're kind of uh, continuing from the fourth one where the, the villain, the arch enemy of, of Harry Potter, whose name is Voldemort, He's come back after being gone for a long time. He's feared by many. He comes back. Harry has to fight him. It was, it was quite an intense scene at the end of the first movie, or the fourth movie. And then in the fifth movie, there's uh, the, the leadership and the media uh, in the magic world are going around spreading basically this, this uh, 
basically disparaging Harry's reputation, saying he's not back. Basically, they were, they were afraid, and they thought he can't be back. They're, they're disparaging Harry's name. No one else was a witness to this happening, and they think Harry, Harry's coming up with this big, tall tale, and they're telling everybody that. And so a lot of Harry's friends are criticizing him, thinking that it couldn't actually have happened. He can't really be back. But Harry is talking to one of his newest friends. They're having a conversation, and she says to him, Luna is her name, she says to him, she says, um, I, I want you to know my dad and I, we believe you. And he says, what do you mean you, we believe you? She says, we believe that you're telling the truth that, that she calls him he who must not be named. Because again, they're afraid to say his name. He who must be not named is back and that you fought him. We believe that. And Harry says, thanks. It seems you're about the only ones who do. Which Luna responds, I don't think that's true. But I suppose that's how he wants you to feel. And Harry says, what do you mean? She says, well, if, if I were you know who... I'd want you to feel cut off from everybody else because if it's just you alone, you're not as much of a threat. And I think, wow, that's such a profound statement. I think that in the season we're in, we're all kind of getting cut off from each other physically. And the opportunity for us to connect and be reassured and be part of community, that, that those, those opportunities are far and few between. And when we do it virtually, sometimes it's just not quite enough of connection that we need. And I think we have a real enemy, Satan. And he wants us to feel like we're being disconnected because if we're disconnected from each other, if we are truly all alone, we're not as much of a threat. We're not as much of a threat in terms of spreading the love and the hope of Jesus to our community. And that's really what I want to talk to you today. In fact, I was thinking about every horror film I think that was ever made. There's Part of the plot is there's a group of people and there's a villain. And in the movie, one by one, for one reason or another, they split up or they peel off and one person at a time gets picked off and, and taken out by the villain. And, and like all the time, if you've ever watched a horror movie, you're kind of watching with this tension of saying, don't split up, stay together. Why would you split up? And we, we, the reason I think that we, we have that tension is because intuitively we know there's strength in numbers. There are, there's strength in numbers. And so we're, we, we kind of uh, just kind of intuitively know that. And as we talk today about not being alone, I hope to change your perspective today. Our perspective in any given situation, I believe, will determine how we respond to that situation. In other words, how we view things determines how we do things. And I think that largely the way we view things is going to determine how we act even this week. Your perspective in any situation, by the way, will largely be determined not by what you go through, but by who you go through it with. And I think when it comes to being not alone, you will respond entirely differently if you feel isolated and alone than you would if you feel in community and together and you're rallying behind each other. It completely changes your perspective in that situation. I was thinking this week, when it comes to isolation, isolation breeds loneliness. It breeds fear and anxiety and panic and helplessness and hopelessness uncertainty, despair, power, powerlessness. But I was thinking if we, if we think about this idea of togetherness, of community, and we get together, we're a family, we're bonded together, we're united, that breeds love, power, hope, confidence, peace, courage, security, strength, safety, and I think ultimately success. And that's the perspective I think we need to have in this situation that we're not alone. So if you want to follow along with me in the notes window, whether you're watching from a phone, on a computer, on a tablet, uh, make sure you got the notes open and follow along with me as we talk about three observations about this truth that we're not alone. And observation number one is this. Number one, God is with us. God is with us. Did you know one of God's names given to us in the Bible is actually Emmanuel? We, we've seen Christmas songs that, that use the word Emmanuel. It, it literally translates, that word literally translates as God with us. As people of faith, God calls us to be part of his family. I said this last week, that we are sons and daughters of God. I want you to listen to the, the words of the wisest man who ever lived when he talks about God in our relationship to him. He says, The faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. And I think about it. Great is his faithfulness. His faithful love never ends. You know, I was taught when it comes to um, when you're bringing people onto your team to, to, to kind of predict how they're going to act on your team, are they going to be a good fit for your team, whether you're hiring them or it's a volunteer, that I, I was taught early on that the best, in, the best predictor of future performance of anybody is, is their past performance. If you want to know how someone's going to act in the future on your team, look at their past performance. What's their track record? And I thought about that. I thought about that with God. What's God's track record? I, with me, in all my life, as far as I can recollect, and all the times I look back in, the, in my life, whether I'm in highs or lows, God 
has always been faithful to me. He always was faithful in every past circumstance. I can't think of one where he was not, I've, where, I've, where I felt neglected, or like his promises didn't come true. God is faithful. He was faithful in the past, which leads me to believe that God is faithful in our present circumstances. What we're going right through right now, God is faithful, and God will be faithful in my future circumstances. I know that. I can trust that because that's the way it always has been in the past. And what has happened with God's character in the past is going to be true in our present and in our future. The author Joshua, in the book of Joshua, in the Old Testament of the Bible, records these words of God. He records God saying this, This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Be strong and courageous. Don't be, don't be afraid. The Lord your God is with you wherever you go. It reminds me of that poem. I, I, if you were with us a few months ago, and I, I talked about this poem called Footprints that we've all are familiar with probably. If you haven't read it, may, maybe look it up. But the, 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 whole, the author, from his perspective, it kind of goes like this. He says there are two sets of footprints in the sand, and, and, the, and the, the sand represents you know, the journey of life. And as the journey of life went on, there was two sets of footprints in the sand, and he knew it was him and it was God beside him during this, the, you know, through all of life. Except for he noticed when he looked back that during the the most troublesome, the hardest trials that he went through in his life, he noticed there was only one set of footprints. And he was wondering, have I been abandoned by God during those moments? Was it those times, the toughest times of my life that God abandoned me? So he, he asks God that in this poem. God says, no, my child, it was during those times that I carried you. It was during the times that was toughest that I was holding you. I held you up with my strength. I tucked you into my arm. You were safe. You were always safe. And I think sometimes when we go through tough trials like we're going through right now with the coronavirus and all that's going on in the world right now, we feel like it's so tough. Has God abandoned me? And the answer is no. God is with you wherever you go. And in fact, during the toughest times, his strength comes through even more. The psalmist David, the one David who sl- slay, slew the, the giant Goliath, the author of, David, of the well-known Psalm 23, we've heard this psalm before, He writes these words, Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. He likens God to a shepherd with a sheep. We are the sheep, God's the shepherd. And he says, You were always there during the darkest times to protect me. You were right there beside me. Your rod and your staff protected and comforted me. What we believe about God in our present situation right now is foundational to our perspective as I was speaking of earlier. And it will largely inform our decision-making in the coming days. My friends, God is close beside us. He is there to protect us and to comfort us, and we can gain strength from that. As I said last week, we do not live by fear. We live by faith. We do not make decisions because of that based on fear. We make our decisions based on faith, faith in God that he's going to be with us to protect us, comfort us, to guide us. God will never leave us, and he will never forsake us. He is there beside us, lending us his strength during our deepest time of need. I want you to believe that. So remember that God is with us. The second observation I want to make during this time of of, of knowing that we're not alone is this. We rise together. We rise together. You see, divided we fall, but united we stand. There is strength in numbers, like I talked about with the horror films. You know, there's strength in numbers. When we bind together, when we band together, we have the opportunity to survive things that we wouldn't otherwise be able to survive. I'm, I'm encouraged by the fact that God is with us, but I'm excited by the prospect that if, if we rise together, that we can accomplish many great things if we unite together. I think the sky is the limit in what we can do in the days ahead when we unite together. Listen to this encouragement from the author of Hebrew, who, Hebrews about togetherness. He says, Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another. Let us motivate each other to acts of love and good works. It's kind of like that professional runner, Rebecca Mara, that I spoke of earlier. Over 11 million people in one day heard her story. I think that she motivated a lot of people towards love and good works. But what can we do? As we rise together, how are we rising together? What are we doing this week to motivate the people around us, the people in our family, the people in our community, the people at the grocery store, at the gas station, at at our work, if we're still able to go into work? How are we motivating the people in our life towards love and good works? Here's what David's son, King Solomon, so we just talked about the words of David, his son, King Solomon of ancient Israel, wrote uh, about this, about the value of being together. He says, two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm. 
But how can, be, be, how can one be, be warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. Man, those are wise words. So profound what he says about this idea of being together and the value of being together. Uh, you know, I, I actually read an article this week. It was um, from the HarperCollins Leadership Essentials. And it was interesting because as I read the words of Solomon that we just read just now, it's interesting how this, what this author says that parallels. The author in the editor's notes says this in the article, the challenges that our teams face are not always ones we select. Sometimes they are thrust upon us and we have no choice but to do the best we can with the team we have or give up and suffer the consequences. They go on to say, the day after my musician friend lost his Broadway gigs because of coronavirus closures, he was hustling. He sold 120 worth of plastic and metal barrels from the dump to a man in East Tennessee. Together, we hosed the insides of the barrels so he could make it to the buyer's location on time. Two people doesn't, make a, doesn't seem like a team, but these days it's all both of us have got. With most of our friends holed up in their apartments in the city and our families self-isolating in towns hours away, our normal support networks have shrunk. Americans haven't quite gone through anything like this. We've never been told to stay in our homes except for essential travel outside of a really bad snow day. Companies have rarely eliminated their entire workforce overnight, leaving people out without jobs. And we're just now realizing how much we truly rely on others to get through one day. He says, we rely on our babysitters to watch the kids while we're away for work. We rely on the grocery store to keep our favorite brand of cereal in stock. First world problems, I guess, but we, we do expect that. We rely on our friends to fill our free time with something other than Netflix binges. Maybe you've done a few of those in these, these uh, recent days being locked up in your house. He also says we rely on our coworkers or employees to be in, our, in their swivel chairs at 9 a.m. sharp every weekday morning. There's nothing we can do alone. If we're going to get through this period of self-isolation, we're going to have to start thinking about the teams in our lives, what we need from them, and what we can give them. I thought, well, that's pretty good. I don't know if this is a person of faith, but it sounds like exactly what we should be doing as a church. Who is your team? Who are the people in your support network? Who are the people that you need to band together with? I think we need to make sure that we're doing that. You know, um, one example I have of, of how we can do this for each other, how we rise together, is from a pastor friend that I have. He, he's in the San Jose uh, kind of Bay Area, and he shared this last week, the story about a woman from their church who had gone into a store, she has a baby, went into the store to buy baby wipes. And when she got to the back where the baby wipes were, they were she discovered they were out of them. But she did see one box of flushable wipes, just generic flushable wipes. So she grabbed them, thankful that she was able to find them. And as she turned to walk back to the cash register to pay for her new flushable wipes, she looked and there was a lady who had seen, just seen that the, all the wipes were gone and realized this lady had just took the last one. She saw the look in the lady's face. And something came over and she, she thought to herself, she thought, I think this lady needs them more than I do. So she told the lady, she said, here, take these. And the lady said, well, don't you need them? She said, yeah, but I think you need them more than I do. And so she handed the, the wipes to this lady and, and walked away. Later, she got online and shared this account with, with some people. And another lady from the same church who had, who had seen her post a story she got in contact with her and said, you know, I actually needed toilet paper, but all they had was flushable wipes. And I don't need that. I really need toilet paper. So I'm going to send these flushable wipes to you. And she sends off these flushable wipes to the lady who gave away hers. And there's a yet another lady from their church who happens to be in Arizona now. And she's watching this whole story unfold online. And so she, realizing that all the toilet paper in the Bay Area has been sold out, goes to her Costco in Arizona and buys a case of toilet paper, brings it home, finds a big box, puts it in this big box and ships it for $35 to the lady who, who didn't have the flushable wipes who gave them away. That, my friends, is how we rise together. When people see a need and we feel that, we give generously of what we have, even if we have nothing left because we gave it away, knowing that our needs are going to be taken care of. That's how we rise together. What a beautiful story. And I honestly, I think that's really cool to hear a story from a friend of mine down in the Bay Area. But in a way, it's a little bit distant from us. And we were up here in Oregon. But I actually have a, a story from last week here from our own church, from, from the Tannisborn campus. And uh, it actually is from a lady who says this, she says, our, as, as our normal paychecks have taken a big uh, downslide with the events of the world, I knew I needed to do something for our family. She says, I started doing Instacart, which is a grocery delivery service for people that can't or don't want to get out. You can text your customers through the app with any replacements or let them know if the store is out of something. 
one of my first customers named Scott needed some big bottled water, which we all know is an high demand uh, item in the stores right now. She goes on to say, I texted and let him know that they didn't have as much as he needed, but that then I remembered we still had one big one left from our daughter's wedding last month that hadn't been opened yet. So I asked him if he wouldn't mind, I could go home first to get, and get it and bring it to, to his order. He then asked how he would pay me since he just pays through the app. My response, pay it forward with kindness. He told me that would be great since he has a brain tumor and needs the purified water to stay extra hydrated. In fact, this exact brand of water is specially pH balanced to keep him hydrated during this time while he waits for, for his brain surgery. As I delivered it to Scott, a young 20-year-old man, he was tearing up with the kindness I had showed. He let me know he was supposed to have his brain surgery last week, but because of what is happening with the coronavirus, it has been postponed because it's, it's uh, more dangerous for him to be in the hospital at this time. I would have hugged him, I said, if it weren't for social distancing, but instead I told him I will pray for him. We both left in happy tears, and I will be keeping my out while in the store for some of his bottled water to drop off again. Man, that story just, it brings tears to my heart. The first time I heard that story, it, I was definitely uh, moved by it. To think that someone from our church selflessly gave of what they had to someone who was in, in a desperate need of something very important. And we have these opportunities, and I believe that's how we as the church, that's how we rise up together. We look for opportunities to be able to be the hands and feet of Jesus to serve the people around us. I want to pause right now and say, you may have a story just like with that story that I just read. If you have a similar story, it doesn't have to be grandiose or some fantastic thing, but if you have a story of how you've been able to spread, or spread love and kindness or share hope with someone in the community, we need to hear those stories. We need to be able to share those stories with others. And so there is a connection card form link at the top of the video player, and I encourage you to connect or click on that connection card and fill it out. There's a, a, a spot at the bottom for you to be able to share a story of how you've been able to see, see that put into action, sharing kindness and love and hope to people. Maybe it was you or maybe something that you witnessed that you can share. We need to, we hear, we need to hear more stories like that because that, my friends, is how we rise together. We need to motivate each other on to love and good deeds now more than ever. And here's a, a few simple ideas of how you can do this yourself to, for, to bind together with the people around you. Number one, get on the chat. You know that less than half the people who are tuning into our services ever even say hello on the chat. Get on there and just say good morning. Get involved in the conversation. There's a great opportunity for you to feel like you're part of something, part of the conversation. Also, you could join an online group. We are, are kicking off a, a number of online groups this week. Uh, the student one actually kicked off last week. But this is a chance for you to get online and see people in a video conference face-to-face -face and be able to share some time together, share each, what's going on in each other's life, be encouraged, be lifted up together. And so at the bottom of the notes, there is a link where you can click on it and you can actually fill out the form and submit that and we'll get, con get you connected to the group of your choice. And so I want to make sure you're aware of that. And then I'll just say this in, in a broad statement, look for opportunities this week to serve. Every time you serve someone, you realize that you're connected more in community with those people. So look for those opportunities. So number one, my first observation today is that God is with us. The second thing is that we rise together. And the last thing is this. We each have a part to play. We each have a part to play. You know, there's a story that I was uh, learned growing up called Stone Soup. And I think it's very fitting for what I want to talk to you about right now. Stone Soup goes like this. If you've never heard it before, you may have. Bear with me. A kindly old stranger was walking through the land when he came upon a village. As he entered, the villagers moved towards their homes, locking their doors and windows. The stranger smiled and asked, Why are you all so frightened? I am a simple traveler looking for a soft place to stay for the night and a warm place for a meal. There's not a bite to eat in the whole province, he was told. We are weak and our children are starving. Better keep moving on. Oh, I have everything I need, he said. In fact, I was thinking of making some stone soup to share with all of you. He pulled an iron cauldron from his cloak and filled it with water and began to build a fire under it. Then, with great ceremony, he drew out an ordinary-looking stone from a silken bag and dropped it into the water. By now, hearing the rumor of food, most of the villagers had come out of their homes or watched from their windows. As the stranger sniffed the broth and licked his lips in anticipation, hunger began to overcome their fear. Ah, the stranger said to himself rather loudly, I do like a tasty stone soup. Of course, stone soup with cabbage, now that's hard to beat. Soon a villager approached hesitantly, holding a small cabbage he'd retrieved from his hiding place. He chopped it up and added it to the pot. Wonderful, cried the stranger. You know, I, I once had stone soup with cabbage and a bit of salt beef as well, and it was fit for a king. 
the village butcher managed to find some salt beef. And so it went through potatoes, onions, carrots, mushrooms, and so on, until there was indeed a delicious meal for everyone in the village to share. The villager el elder offered the stranger a great deal of money for the magic stone, but he refused to sell it and traveled on the next day. As he left, the stranger came upon a group of village children standing near the road. He gave the silken bag containing the stone to the youngest child, whispering to the group, It was not the stone, but the villagers that had performed the magic. I want to tell you today that it's us, we, it's we, us doing our part that performs the magic. It's the magic happens when we each do our part. See, we're not alone, but it's not about all the comfort and security that we can gain from the people around us. Yes, that's true. We get that. But it's also about us doing our part. Community is about each of us doing our part. People are serving us, and we're serving other people. That's what we have to do. It reminds me of the story of a, these fishermen that were out in a fishing boat, and they discovered um, there's two guys on the back end and two guys on the front end, and the guys on the front end discovered a leak in the boat. And so they're feverishly trying to plug it, and one, one of them's plugging the hole, and one of them's trying to bail water out of the boat. And the two on the other end, the one guy said, well, she help them? And the guy said, no, nah, we're okay. It's on their end of the boat. I think that's a silly, silly illustration, but really, a lot of times we, we, we kind of sit back and expect everybody else to do the work. But we're all in this boat together. We need to stick together. And if, if, if we're going to survive this, if we're going to go through this season and come out stronger on the other side, we all have to do our part. Look at what Paul uh, in the New Testament, he's one of the, the authors of the New Testament, what he says about each of us playing our part. He writes these words. In his grace, God has given us different parts for doing certain things well. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you are a teacher, teach well. Now, I want to pause there. I think what Paul was talking about was teaching, teaching the gospel and sharing people, with people your faith, teaching them that way. But I want to pause and, and recognize and maybe share some words of encouragement with those of you out there who are listening in who are teachers, who are teachers who in the last two weeks, your, your carpet has been ripped right out from underneath you and everything you were taught, everything you know from experience about teaching children at school is out the window and everything has completely changed. The paradigm has shifted and now in two weeks we've gone from kids in a classroom in, in the way we all are familiar with and have grown up with to now all kids starting this week are going to online and at least in our district, the kids are going back to school online. And I know this is kind of scary. I know that as, as we move forward in the, in the coming days and weeks that there will be a lot of learning as we make mistakes through this process. But I want to pause and tell you teachers that I believe in you. Thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. My kids are going back to school this week and I believe in you and, and your ability to empower my children to learn and to grow and to educate them. And I know it's going to be tough. I know there are many battles ahead. There will be many challenges. But I believe in you. I think we all believe in you. We, we know that you can do this. In fact, um, I, I want to share with you a, a thought. Success doesn't come from holding a good hand. Success comes from playing a poor hand well. And in this season, you haven't been dealt the best hand. But you have an opportunity to take the hand that you've been dealt and to play it well. And I think as, as I talk to teachers and the spirit of the teachers that, that are emailing my children, is that exactly what you're going to do? And I'm, I just want us all right now maybe to kind of spur you guys on and encourage you by clicking that heart button right now for the teachers that are out there and let them know, show some love to the teachers as they go back to work this week and, and try to help our kids learning in an online experience. I want to continue on in the words of Paul. He says, if your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it is giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. I want to point out to you, as Paul shares, you know, take what God has given you, the resources, the talents, whatever God has given you, and pour those out on, on other people. I want to say something I've said before, and that is this. Nothing you were given, nothing, your money, your resources, your talents, your gifts, your experiences, nothing that you have was given for you to squander, but was rather given to you so you could give it away, to pour out in other people. And I think that's exactly what you need to do during this time. Look for what you can do. And everyone has a different part to play during this season. But look for what you can do and pour yourself out on other people. I want to point out to you that you can't give what you don't have. If you're empty, if you're running on empty, there's nothing to pour out. You need to keep yourself full. And Something that I've learned along the way, at least in my spiritual journey, that the way I stay full for seasons like this, because it really isn't seasons like this that, show, that, that, uh, that, that help us define who we are. It's the seasons like this that show who we really are. So when we go through a crisis, the true colors start shining through. When we go through crisis, the pressure that's put on us, that squeezes out who we really are. 
And in this season, if you want to be a person of character who's, who's strong and rooted and has something to give, to be able to pour out on others, you've got to constantly pour into yourself. You've got to constantly invest in yourself. And I found there's no better way to do that than, than establishing some core spiritual habits in your life. And you may have heard me talk about this in the last few weeks, but we're in this season right now. Uh, about a year ago, we launched this thing called All In. And All In was really saying, hey, there's a lot of people coming on, uh, being a part of our church right now. And what, we can do, what can we do to partner with people and help them take their best next step in their spiritual growth journey? We each have a, a step that we can take. And I know for one person it might, might be to serve. And for other person it might be to read their Bible and pray. For someone else it might be to share their faith. For someone else it might be to give. But we each have an opportunity to do something, to grow in this area of, of building our spiritual character. And the only way to do that that I know how, there's no like magic pill or silver bullet. It really just comes down to your daily core habits. See, our daily habits define who we are. They define our success. And so as we're in this one, we're now one year into two year journey on all in, we're kind of pausing for a, a half time refresh. We're saying, okay, we're about one year into this thing. Let's go back and refresh some of these habits and how we can grow in them and how we can take our best next step right now in our spiritual journey. And so we provided a couple of resources. In fact, um, there is in your notes, there's a link for these as well, but there's also a link at the top of the screen for you who are watching on a computer. But there's a little brochure called All In. We kind of tell you uh, what All In's about and what we're doing as, as a Tansborn campus specifically. In fact, the backside, there's five things that we're, we would love to ask for you to pray for. And so I encourage you to check that out if you haven't. Be, be uh, uh, familiar with how this thing looks. And also there's this orange card, which is also linked there as well on the page in those two spots that I just mentioned. And All In... Uh, this all-in card really is a spiritual assessment guide where you can take these six spiritual habits, these cornerstone habits that can help you build a foundation that allows you to have something to give when the time comes for you to pour out. And I think that this is the best way that you can fill yourself up. You can, you can build yourself up in six ways. Number one is connecting, connecting in community. We already talked about groups and opportunities to connect. That's today's topic is not alone. It's all about being connected, being together. Then there's serving, opportunities to serve. We have opportunities right now to look around to serve people. You may say, well, I'm stuck at home. Who am I going to serve? How about you start with the people in your own house? Opportunities you have to serve them. Then there's Bible reading. Maybe we struggle in that area. And each one of these, by the way, has a scale of one to five where you can rate yourself and you can come back later on and see how you're doing. But there's some intentional steps you can take and some guides for each one of these and how you can grow. And there's, on the back side of the card, there's prayer. And maybe you need to grow in prayer right now more than ever. Prayer is something we should lean into. Prayer is something that can strengthen us and build us and encourage us during this season. Then there's giving, and maybe generosity is a tough area for you, and especially if times are tough right now and, and maybe the finances are lean because of the current economic season that we're in. This could be a tough area, but I'll tell you, my family and I, we are committed to generosity. We will continue to be generous so long as we have the means to do that. We want to be faithful and obedient to God in that area, and we have an opportunity to do that. And then the last one is sharing. Maybe now more than ever, your opportunity, your friends are a lot more open, open now right now to hearing about faith, to hearing about coming to church than they ever have been in my lifetime, I believe, in these last two weeks. And I'm, I think going forward, that's going to continue. Maybe the best thing you can do right now is to spread the word on, on your social media feeds or reach out to friends or people that you know and let them know that we are sharing a message of hope and love each week at our online Tannisborn services and they should check them out, get, in, get them engaged, get them plugged in so they also can hear this message of hope and be encouraged as well. But that's what All In's about and I encourage you to, to lean into that because if we're running on empty, we have nothing to pour out. Here's Paul's words, this guy we just read, Paul's words to the church in the ancient town of Corinth about this idea of, of being generous with ourselves. He says, remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. And I want to pause there and point out to you, if you want to see fruit from your life, you have to sow something. A farmer would be, be ludicrous to not plant any seeds and look out the window every day to see if there's sprouts coming up. You first have to plant in order for something to come up. And you can only harvest what you, what you sow in the first place. So I want to encourage you in your life, there are opportunities right now for you to sow in different various ways. Look for those opportunities. Paul goes on to share the results of our generosity. He writes this, As the scriptures say, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Here's the result. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. If you want your good deeds to be remembered for, forever, then you've got to sow generously. And I think about if there's anything that I want for people to remember about me during this time is that I was a generous person, that I gave generously, that I wasn't a hoarder, that I wasn't just worried about myself, but I, but I opened myself up and said, I'm giving away generously whatever. Whenever I see a need, if I have an opportunity to fill that need, I'm going to do that. 
Did you know that your generosity points to the generosity of God? If you want people to see God in you, you have to live it out. You have to embody it. My question to you this morning is this. Does the generosity of your life reflect the generosity of God? If not, ask yourself, what can I do to change that? How can I improve in, in different areas in my generosity? I want to challenge you to be ready to roll up your sleeves. I said this last week. They keep telling us to wash our hands and practice you know, good sanitation by keeping our hands clean. I want you to do that and keep doing that. But I also want you, after you've done that, to put a serving towel on your arm. Be ready to wash someone's feet. Look for opportunities to serve. Many of you have asked me in the, in the last week especially, how can I help? You're looking for ways to serve. I, I know that right now as the church is meeting online, many people are saying, how can I contribute? How can I help in this current season? And it's kind of been tough for me because we're so used as a church to being able to have physical things where we could say, well, we need help with this or we need help with that. But everything's been pushed online and we can't get together. And so the, the opportunities to serve in physical ways is very limited. And that's, that's hard for me as a pastor to not be able to say, well, here's something you can do to help out. But I, I've thought about it, and here's the things I want to share with you that I think right now are the best help. And we're working for op opportunities to connect you with physical ways you can help as well, practical ways. But here's how I believe you can help. Number one, and I believe this is the most important one, pray. I need your prayer right now more than ever. This is, there is no roadmap. There is no owner's manual for the season that we're in right now. And I want to make sure that as a church that we're doing the best job we can of stewarding the season, stewarding our resources, stewarding our, stewarding our opportunities to reach our community. And so I could use your prayers. My family could use your prayers right now as this is a, a very, very um, stressful season, working through and making sure that we keep church going and I'll continue to offer hope in every way that we can possibly do that. Another way that's very practical that you can help out if you have the means to do this, and that is to be generous with your finances. One of the most practical ways you can help right now is to be generous in that way. See, if we're constantly having to worry about whether or not we're going to be able to pay the bills during this season, then our focus has to go back to that as opposed to looking for every opportunity we have to go full force in the community and spread love and hope to those around us and be able to equip you guys and partner with you in, in this process. So if you have that opportunity to do that, you know, if you don't, if you just got laid off this week and you can't do that, man, I'm not trying to put a guilt trip on anybody, but I'm just saying, if you have the means and the, the capability to be generous, that is one practical way that you can help out. There's another way, and that is, and this is a practical, physical way that you can help out, and that's through blood drives. Our blood drive coordinator, as I mentioned last week, has reached out to me, and as of now, we have three blood drives on the schedule. We may add more to that. One of them is this Saturday. The first one's this Saturday on April 4th. I'm pleased to tell you, as of Thursday, that drive is already full. You can't sign up for it anymore. All the slots are full. That is the demand right now for people who want to give blood, but they, they don't have enough drives open for people who want to give blood. But there are two more drives coming up. One of them is next Friday, April 9th. I believe it's, no, it's next Thursday, April 9th. Um, a week from this Thursday, rather. And then we have one coming up on April 24th, and you can sign up for both of those. And there are links in your notes today where you can click on those right now, and you can sign up for either one of those drives. If you want to be able to contribute in that way, I, I encourage you, do it now, because those drives, as we get closer to them, are also going to fill up as well. I've also heard that Meals on Wheels is right now in need. We don't have any direct connection right now to them, but if you get on their website, uh, they, they are, their mission is to serve elderly people in their homes that can't get out and get food. And the problem is that most of the volunteers who serve the elderly are also elderly as well, and, and they're, they have to be in home and socially isolate for their own health sake. And so if you are healthy and have the opportunity, connect with Meals on Wheels and you can, you can be helping that way. I also want to tell you this. You can help right now by being the church. What I mean by that is you don't need an official church sanctioned project or mission to be able to help out and be the church. You can actually do acts of love and kindness to people in the community in the name of Jesus anytime you want. You don't need my permission or pr approval for that. So I challenge you, if you want to help, look for the people in your life that you, can, that you can show God's love to in practical ways. Look for ways to serve people. And finally, look for opportunities to invite people to join us online. I've already mentioned that just a moment ago, but I want to point out to you that Easter is coming up in two weeks. Two weeks from this Sunday is Easter, April 12th. And we are going to be pulling out all the stops and doing everything we can to provide the most amazing, awesome online experience we can for our Easter services. And we want to connect with people in community. And there's so many people right now who are in despair, who, who are, are discouraged, who are lacking hope, who are stressed out, who are uh, full of anxiety. And we have the opportunity to be able to share the love and hope of Jesus with them with the most amazing love story that ever happened that the God of the universe gave his son as a sacrifice so we could have a relationship with God. He sacrificed his perfect son for us. 
And what an amazing story that is. And we'll be sharing that story and, and, and challenging and encouraging people on that Sunday. And so look for opportunities right now to be reaching out to the people in your circles of influence and invite them to be a part of that. You know, as we wrap up today, I was thinking about this story. Um, there's there's a, uh, the story about this Cherokee, a Native American Cherokee chief, and he's talking to his grandson, and he says to his grandson, he says, there are two wolves. There's a evil wolf, and there's a good wolf. And his grandson looks up to him and says, Grandpa, which one's going to win? And the grandpa looks to the, the grandson, and he says, the one you feed. The one you feed. See, what I focus on right now expands in my life. It begins to take over. And if right now your, your life is consumed by media and all these negative outlets about all the bad things that are going on in the world because of coronavirus right now, you're feeding the beast. You're feeding the beast of fear. And that beast, if, if you keep feeding it, will win out in your life. And so I'm going to encourage you like I did two weeks ago and tell you that if you are, are watching all this stuff, it's, it's not that this stuff is necessarily bad. It, well, some of the stuff is a little blown out of proportion, I'll be honest with you. It's not that it's so much bad, it's that you're, you're just consumed with it. And you need to fast from that. If you haven't fasted from social media and news media that is talking about all the negative things that are happening with the coronavirus, can I encourage you to shut that stuff off? Just take a break from it. You know, you only need to get on a couple times a day. And I would advise you get on CDC's website and the World Health Organization website. You get everything you need to know about it right there. And just a couple minutes, a couple times a day is enough to keep you informed. But what you feed your, in your life, what you feed your mind is going to consume you. And when you feed your fear, you get paralyzed. When you're paralyzed, you're not going to go out there and you're not going to serve people in the community. You get scared. And you start wondering if, if you give of, of give of what you have, are you going to have enough for yourself or for your family? And you begin to become paralyzed by that fear. But what you, when you feed your faith, the faith that you have and the fact that God has, has told us he's with us and that we can rise together because he formed us for this community. He wants us to be together. He wants us to do this together that we have an opportunity to feed our faith. And when you do that, you're able to move forward. You're able to, to step out boldly. I hope today your perspective has shifted and that you're ready to move, from because, for, move forward because you are not alone. I want you to remember that you're not alone. You're not alone. You don't have to go out there and you don't have to be alone this week. You are not alone. There are people in your life that you can connect with. There are West Siders. There are people in the community you can connect with. And, and most of all, remember that God is with us. God is with us. He will never leave us and he will never forsake us. And I want to ask you, like I did ask you last week, that you go out there this week and that you be a dealer of hope. Be a hope dealer. Deal it out to everybody you connect with, whether it be in person or online. Deal hope this week. See, I'm a person who's optimistic. And I, as I look into the future in the next coming months, I know we've got you know, some challenges to overcome right now, but I believe we're going to come out better for it on the other side. I really, truly believe that. But I'm also a person of hope. And the difference between hope and optimism is, is this. Optimism is the belief that things will get better. But hope is the belief that together we can make things better. And I believe that's what we can do together. And I am hopeful that we as a church can unite together and we can take on this thing. We can rise out of the ashes and together we will come emerge on the other side of this thing stronger, better, um, more courageous on the other side of this thing that we went into it. I want to challenge you to be a part of that. Here's my reminder to you today is that just because we're in a bad situation today doesn't mean that everything has to be bad. There are moments and there's pockets of good throughout this entire bad experience that we're all going through right now. And you don't have to be focused on the negative. During this time, I believe that we as a church have the chance to shine better than ever. And but, but, but I believe that the true outcome will be determined, though, by what we do. The true outcome is going to be determined by what we do. And if, if we do nothing, now we can't be better together. We can't shine brighter. The only way that can happen is if we realize that we rise together, but we realize in order to do that, we each have a part to play. As we close our time together, I want to remind you that as a person of faith, we live by faith and not by fear. And we are also not alone. God is with us. And if God is with us, nothing can stand against us. We have the power to rise together, but only if we each do our part. So my question for you is this. What will you do this week? I just want to pause right now and, and, and talk to you. I keep saying as we, we've been having this conversation that as people of faith that we're not afraid and that we're not alone. But maybe today, as we respond to this crisis, maybe today you're not a follower of Jesus and so you're someone who's looking for that kind of hope that we talked about today. You, you can have that hope. God can fill your life and he can, he can be God with you. And you can be not alone and you can also be a person who's not afraid because God is with you. 
And if that's you today, can I invite you to accept Jesus? If you want to know and accept the God who made you to love you, the one who gave his son Jesus in this beautiful love story to die on a cross for you, to die a, 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 a horrible, torturous death on a cross as a perfect person. He went to, to, to the grave, was buried in a tomb, and three days later he conquered the grave and death. He rose victoriously so that we could have a relationship with him. If you want that God to be in your life, I'm going to say a prayer in a moment. And when I do, I invite you silently in your own heart to pray this prayer as a way of saying, God, I, I agree with what, what Pastor Mike is saying. I agree with that. I want you in my life today. I'm asking you to enter and I'm surrendering myself to you today. And if you would like to pray that prayer, pray it with me now. Jesus, thank you for loving me and for saving me and inviting me to be a part of your family, be, to be in relationship with you. I believe in you, your life, your death on the cross and your resurrection. Forgive me of my sins. Fill me with your spirit. Lead me and teach me to follow you. As best as I know how, I surrender my life to you. I want to learn to love you back because you love me so much. I want to spend the rest of my life following you and allowing you to transform my heart, my mind, and my life. I pray this in your name. Amen. Now, if you just prayed that prayer, I want to say first off, congratulations. But would you do something for me? I'm going to ask you, there's a, there's a little hand button in the chat box that's showing up there. And if that's you, this is anonymous, by the way, I want you to click the hand button to indicate that you're, you've made that decision that for the very first time, you just accepted God in your life to be your forgiver and your leader. And you want to follow him. You want to live your life for him. If that's you, check that box right now or check that, that button right now. Click that button right now and uh, just uh, indicate that you're raising your hand saying, God, I, I just accepted you in my life. I'd love to be able to pray for you. And so I appreciate if you do that now. I just want to say a prayer over all of us right now. Would you pray with me? Dear God, remind each person who is tuning in right now that they don't have to be alone. That as people of faith, you are standing with us and we have nothing to fear. In addition, help us to be keenly aware of the power that comes from being connected in community. That you have designed us as relational beings to be in relationship with you and each other because you are a relational God. God, there is strength when we stand united and when we lock arms, we are confident that we will rise together. Taking that first step can be scary, but God, we know when we do, you will go with us and strengthen us and as we work together to show your love to others this week. Give us each the courage to take that leap of faith. And once again, would you embolden each of us to shine your light this week. We continue to pray for those who are hurting and who are sick. We pray for healing, and for protection. We do continue to pray for a vaccine for this ugly disease. We pray a special prayer for our civic, state, and national leaders who are daily making tough decisions as we navigate these uncharted waters. God, just like we prayed last week, we ask for your church that as the world grows darker, that our light would shine brighter. Use this, God, this week to let your light shine. Amen.